coaching, as you said, in general is selfless, but I kind of wonder with this next story if it's actually selfish in a lot of ways, because one of the stories that has been, I think, the biggest story this month was John Calipari, who we talked about, I think, right before we left for Charlotte or maybe right after we came back from Charlotte about John Calipari and whether maybe it was time for him to move on. And even though he had a lifetime contract, we thought, well, that maybe will come to fruition at some point, depending on what happens in future years. And little did we know that two weeks later it was going to happen and he was going to be the one to instigate that change. And he left the University of Kentucky for the University of Arkansas. That was a big shock for me. I don't know how you took that. I can't say I'm incredibly surprised that he left. I mean, yeah, it's tough to walk away from a lifetime contract, but I think that this is one of those deals where in the end, I think both the University of Kentucky and John Calipari are coming out um, coming out better, you know, because it, it's just one of those deals where it wasn't like it was completely in the gutter, but obviously he wasn't performing up to uh, the Kentucky standard. I think that their fans are crazy and delusional. Um, it, it's absolutely nuts. And I got to experience some of that uh, listening to a couple of X spaces and podcasts where they had some fans come on and participate. Like as these transactions, these coaching moves were happening, like in real time, like this is going on. And I'm listening to these fans after they realize Cal's going and like they had nothing but negative things to say about him and his time at Kentucky, which whatever. Okay. I mean, for me, it's like, as a mid-major basketball fan, I'm sitting there like, come on, man. Like, you're, like, complaining about, like, getting your million dollars in 20s instead of hundreds. Like, that's what, you know, it just seems like those are, like, <laughs> first-world problems, you know. But they're they're sitting there like they were talking about who they were going to hire. And there was all this conversation about, you know, Danny Hurley and, you know, uh, Billy Donovan. And obviously Patino's name was thrown in there and others. And they're like, you know what, like, we'll get whoever we want. Like that was their mentality is whoever we want would anybody would be willing to come here, you know, like whoever it is we want, we're going to get them. And like, obviously I think they ended up down to like their fourth choice. Um, but we'll get, we'll circle back to that in a second, but him going to Arkansas, it's funny. Cause I think that their, their dysfunction actually led to them kind of hitting a home run in this case, because I feel like, uh, you know, the Tyson family, like Tyson chicken, like they're located, um, you know, in the Northwest Arkansas area, obviously the Walton family with Walmart, there's a lot of money in Northwest Arkansas near Fayetteville. And I think they sat back and they were watching this coaching search and being like, what is going on? And they decided, you know what, like the, the kind of the power brokers, the money decided they were going to get involved. And uh, at that point in time, because how much of a shit show it was, they came in and they put, they fronted whatever was needed to go get John Calipari. So you had a guy that was looking to get out of, probably a situation where he'd overstayed his welcome. You have a university that's, you know, would be starving to have a, a nationally relevant program. And Arkansas hasn't been bad. I mean, they haven't been like terrible by any means, but to have a coach that's going to come and take them, you know, to final fours and things like that, they had the money and it, it just kind of worked out. You know, it was sort of the perfect situation. I think, like I said, I think all three parties, Arkansas, John Calipari and Kentucky all ultimately got what they wanted when it's all said and done. Cause Kentucky's not stuck with Cal anymore, who they were unhappy with. Cal's not stuck with Kentucky anymore, who he was unhappy with. He's getting his money. He's getting the fresh start. Arkansas is getting a great coach, and they all win. This brings up a bunch of things for me. First of all, this is the second time we've been talking in this fashion about a coach taking a job or not taking a job, because at the beginning of this year, we talked about Alabama. Nick Saban inexplicably retired at the time, and you said that Kalen DeBoer was probably their fifth choice because a bunch of the other coaches that they reached out to said, I'm good. And that's a job that you and I both agreed anybody would want. But it's about timing. It's about when or who you're taking over for. And say what you want about Coach Cal. He was successful there. They won national championships there. So maybe the most recent, what have you done for me lately, look at his tenure there was disappointing because of first run exits or early exits. But national championships is the standard at Kentucky. And they did that. And they, I think they did that at least once, maybe not twice. I can't exactly remember. Somebody will correct me on that at some point. But my point is, is there was a level of success that just about any program would take. And Arkansas had won a national championship back in the mid-90s. I think it was like 94 that they won it. And so it had been a while. And they're a school where the landscape of college sports has changed so much that you need to make a move. 
And this is really, to me, a message to any school out there is put the money together and you can buy yourself a championship level coach. And Coach Cal going there now, he's got to feel really good. Number one, he's getting paid a lot, which probably isn't a big deal to him at this point because he's made a ton of money coaching. But there are really no expectations. Like, I don't think that the fan base is like national championship or bust because this reminds me of Steve Spurrier going from Florida to South Carolina. South Carolina hadn't really done a whole lot. And just by having him there, they were elevated. And that was great for them. They never could get over the hump of beating the best teams in the country, but they haven't done a whole lot since. And so I think this is kind of, it's it, it makes me feel so many things because it's similar to so many different situations. But I think at the end of the day, you find out, just throw money at a coach and you're probably going to be able to get him. And I think there's something to be said for being a basketball coach at a football school. You know, you're not the highest profile uh, sport on campus. Where at Kentucky, that's not the case. Now, yes, uh, Mark Stoops, the football coach, he's done a great job at Kentucky, and they've been um, they've been very relevant the last several years. But they're still not the number one show in, in town in Lexington, man. It's not the basketball close. program, yeah. Not even in the in, in the same stratosphere. So I do think that they're you know that's nice because you can, uh, for lack of a better term, fly under the radar a little bit maybe if you're Cal because the bar just isn't as high, you know, and everybody's wrapped up in. Arkansas football and if the basketball team can be highly successful that's just a bonus right that's just the cherry on top so I think that's really exciting and also we talked about coaches maybe not willing to move and some of these you know high profile programs having to go down to second third fourth choices I feel like the uh, the NIL climate may have a lot to do with that because with NIL I can only assume that you get a lot of these uh, I don't know if you want to call them um, handlers, whatever, the bag men, the people with the money. I have to imagine at certain places that those people want to have a lot of say in where that money is going and who it's going to. I think that if you're somewhere where you've got that good relationship with those people and you've got everything you need from a resource standpoint, facilities to put a successful team on the field. And, you know, let's I, the, the job that comes to mind to me when we're talking about this, like Ole Miss. Right, Lane Kiffin, and Ole Miss. Like, Ole Miss is far from like the sisters of the poor. You know, I mean, they've they've got a, a well established program in the SEC, and they're the type of program that with a, a couple with a good recruiting class, like they could make a run, and with, especially with the twelve team playoff, like they could get themselves into the playoff every few years and have a chance to make a run to to get to a national championship game. Um, they're not going to be probably in contention yearly. But I think that if you're Lane Kiffin, you look around, and you're like, you know, I got a pretty good gig here, you know, because if I go to Alabama and in three years we haven't won a national championship, I'm going to get crucified, yes. you know. So and, and I have the relationships with the people here. Um, we got a good thing going. I'm comfortable. My family likes it. We're happy. We're winning. And I think more coaches are content to, like, just be good with that. Yeah, and so much of it has to do with situation. I mean, who wants to take over after Nick Saban? Who wants to take over? after Coach Cal, right? It's because there's a bar that has been set that is so difficult to match when you're going after somebody. And again, like I said, I understand that they've had first round exits, but a national championship was won in the 10 years since Coach Cal got to Kentucky. And so whoever follows them, which turns out to be Mark Pope from BYU, has to meet that standard. And it's a tough ask. And I think it depends on where you are, the situation. like. When they talked about Dan Hurley and, and Kentucky said they were going to throw whatever money at him, in my opinion, I'm like, why would he leave? Not only is it a bad fit, I think, culturally, just in terms of like how he coaches, but you're coming off two national championships with Connecticut. The NIL people there are just going to continue to give you what you need to continue that dynasty. Why would you leave? Why would you leave that? Or if you're at a school that has very similar resources and you know that you could continue to get in players and be able to recruit without all of the expectations that come with the fandom and everything that comes with Kentucky, I think that coaches have thought this way differently now. And I think it, it's awesome to me that these coaches are being like, thanks, but no thanks. No, I think so too. And, and in the Kentucky situation, they may, they certainly didn't make the, the biggest like splash hire they could have made, but when it's all said and done, they may have made the best hire yeah. for them. And that's what, I mean, it's yet to be seen, but 
I think that when it comes down to it, man, it's about things like fit, like you mentioned. I mean, he's a Kentucky alum. He played on a national championship team. Which I didn't know, uh, by the way. Like, yeah. I did not realize that. And so that shows my ignorance that when I saw the hire, I was like, huh? And it turns out it probably was a good fit from that perspective because he's been embedded there. Yeah. I mean, we talk, you know, I've kind of made reference to the these crazy Kentucky fans. But, like, I mean, he's one of them. You know, I mean, he, he is one of them. And I think that that's kind of what you need. You know, Cal was almost, even if was, as long as he was there, he was always sort of an outsider, I feel like, just because of his his personality, where he's from. He just, he doesn't look like Kentucky, you know what I mean? Like, he just, you don't get that feel. He's more of a Northeast, like, you know, like, I don't know, I think like a stockbroker looking guy, you know, Wall Street, you know, that's what. He's a what CEO I, type. Yeah. And, um. You know, I think that he was always still sort of an outsider while he was there. You know, I think in this case they got a really good fit. Who knows the who knows the lay of the land in Lexington, and um, you know they now just what's left is to put a team together and go win basketball games, right? Piece of cake. Yeah, piece of cake in today's NIL world. But they're Kentucky; they should be able to recruit on the name of Kentucky because I do think that it's still a desirable place to land in the college basketball landscape. Because I don't think that college basketball is the same as football where I think the the location geographically matters as much for for some of these players. I mean, because I, I just don't think that it matters in because of when it's played and how it's played. It's indoors. Like there's a lot of different things. And right, I think that exactly. The, you know what I mean? There's a lot more yep. factors there. And also there's a lot less players too. So you can make more of an impact going somewhere. And I think that's just, yeah. I, I think that's the changing of it. Yeah, if the weather mattered in basketball, Gonzaga would be terrible. Right. Or anywhere that's super, super cold. Like all those mid-major teams that are in the Midwest where it's like super free, like people wouldn't go there, but it doesn't really matter. And I don't think that, I mean, maybe maybe it does to an extent, but like your social life, because you're focusing so much on basketball, really matters in that way too. There's not as much exposure as there is for college football players. Where you're a college football player, you could be in commercials. Not saying you can't for basketball, it's just not as common, in my right. opinion. Is no, it? I agree. Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, yeah, and you said it's played indoors. That's a big factor. I think more so maybe like from a social perspective, it's the social life, the the, the city itself or, you know, things like that, uh, that that have more of an impact than the weather. But I do think the weather is very relevant in the world of uh, college football. I do too. And we mentioned Dan Hurley. So UConn wins the national championship again in very dominant fashion. They didn't look like they really... I mean, Purdue gave them a little bit of a run in that game, but their run through the national championship through the NCAA tournament was pretty much a revenge tour for a team that was defending their national championship, which is just funny to me. But Dan Hurley has created a dynasty, a juggernaut who knows how long it will last. He's looking to make it a dynasty. On the other side of that, though, you had Purdue, and Zach Eady is a guy that I've noticed got a lot of hate on the internet for, I guess, how he played, how he was officiated, and... From all accounts, in my opinion, he seems like he's a pretty decent guy and played the game, played very hard, trained really hard, and he got a lot of hate. And I didn't think it was warranted, but a lot of people are asking now, like, what does he look like in the NBA? And he's, so what, 7'4", super lanky. I think he will have a fit in the NBA, but I just don't think that his playing style and the way that the NBA is built with all these players being big, like I'm talking about like muscular, I'm not sure how he fits in, but he's a good player, and I don't think he deserved the hate that he got. Yeah, I feel like in the NBA these days, granted there are there are some guys that resemble traditional big men, but I feel like everybody is like a, you know, whether you're the point guard or you're the, you know, technically the five man, like everybody has to play the game like a wing. Um, everybody's got to be able to shoot the three. Everybody's got to be able to handle the basketball. Everybody's got to be able to uh, create their own shot and get get to the rim when need be and i just you know there's a lot of things on that list i just named that don't don't seem to be a part of his game um as as far as how he was officiated i didn't watch a lot of purdue games um honestly i don't know if i watched an entire game outside of maybe the fin- the two games in the final four for them you mentioned it you know uconn was they were they were head and shoulders better than everybody else they played it wasn't even close no. and i really didn't expect that honestly and you just talk about a master class in coaching and motivation from Danny Hurley. I mean, I you, I don't know if you heard about the, the the transportation debacle for them when they were supposed to go out to the Final Four. Like they arrived like a solid 
like 24 hours at least later than every other team because they had plane issues and everything else. And then, you know, they're crossing like three time zones to get there. And so, of course, you know, all of the the mainstream national networks are getting sleep doctors on and everything else to talk about the impact of uh, uh, their bodies adapting and having to cross time zones and all that stuff. And I guarantee you that he loves that stuff. It wouldn't oh, surprise me please. if he engineered it to be that way so he could use it as, as motivation. I, I absolutely love it. And I'm all about, I mean, it, it's some people probably think it's petty or whatever, but that's just the thing about great coaches. Great coaches know how to motivate their team. And by whatever means necessary, they know what buttons to push and win. And uh, when when that happens, man, you, you see the results right there in the way that UConn played throughout the entire tournament. And I, I remember they kept playing that clip throughout the tournament. Earlier in the year, UConn got beat by somebody. I don't even know who it was. And in the post-game press conference, Danny Hurley's like, you better get us now. You know what I mean? Because later this, this isn't going to happen. Well, and you recruit players that buy into that mentality, that share that mentality. And that shows a good coach, not just in coaching and motivating, but recruiting too. Because for the last three seasons or however long he's been there, building this team, this has been a group of players who buy into this. So if it was engineered, they're totally all about it. And they love his grittiness. And I do too, because I think that not every coach should be the same. I know that when people watch these coaches, they think that they should be a certain way in order to do business. And you can be who you are, be authentic as a coach. And as long as you're recruiting players who are going to respond to that, Brian Wardle does that at Bradley, I think you get coach, you get players. It's why he goes international a lot of times because he knows they can coach them hard. They're going to respond at least most of the time. And that's what you have to do in today's landscape. And I think he does a fantastic job of it. And I love personally the idea of a defending national champion or a defending champion or whatever sport it is that you play coming out and acting like they are an underdog and playing with a chip on their shoulder as if they're out for revenge, even though they're the ones who everybody's trying to knock off. And I loved watching them play, and they, they they played some good teams. Let's not forget that they beat Alabama, who was the highest scoring team by far, wasn't even close. Like, not even, right. they were like swatting a gnat away. It's and like that's some Bill mentality. Belichick shit, man. It kind of is, right? With a little bit more, I think, understanding of how today's players work. And that, again, is a testament to how you adapt to today's landscape. And a lot of coaches can't do that. Like, Coach Cal is getting paid a lot to go to Arkansas, but can he do that, right? Can he relate to new players today? The other night on the on the feed for the draft, we talked about Tom Izzo. And I actually said to you, I think in Charlotte, like he's kind of nearing that point of he may need to get out while the getting has been good already because maybe he's not game for the way the system is today. You need a, a little bit more forward-thinking coach. It doesn't matter how they coach, but again, it's how you motivate and how you do a lot of things. But I just want to go back to one thing. Because I know that you talking about Kentucky and talking about expectations, and I said, why would Dan Hurley leave that? And you thought that Kentucky's not really a desirable job because of all the things that it comes with. Now, I wanted to give you a school that I think is kind of in the same boat that still thinks it's relevant. I think Kentucky's relevant, but is relevant. And I think that getting that coaching gig matters to a lot of people who are pure blood college basketball people, but I don't think it matters. And that's Indiana University. Yeah, man, that's a good one. I, I was sitting there trying to think in my head, like where you were going to go with this, like what you know, because I, I one name that popped into my head. Uh, this isn't quite on the level of Indiana, obviously, but a uh, a team that a once proud program that's really fallen from grace. I think like Georgetown, something like that. But Indiana for sure has um, just fallen off. They're, they're like Nebraska in football, very very similar to Nebraska in football, and. You know they they went on a great run with a legendary coach, won a lot of games, won championships. Uh, you know Indiana is the basketball capital um, of the world, maybe. That's why and, I bring it up because yeah. of that. And they just have not found a way to, I guess, recapture the success of the past. And I don't know if it's a matter. I mean, when you've, I get you might miss on a coach, but what are they on? You know since. Since Who, Bob Knight thing, left, like that's the thing fifth, though, it doesn't six, matter. Seven, I mean, yeah, it doesn't matter what coach they brought. You can't tell me every hire they've made has been absolutely terrible. Nope. Um, Tom Crean was Crean yeah. the coach there for a while. Yeah, I mean, they, and they were oh, they were s somewhat successful, but I'm talking about like I think that Indiana has been viewed for a long time, and Purdue's kind of in that realm, not the same, but like 
Purdue being relevant, you think about how long it had been since they'd been to a Final Four. And again, a Midwest school that kind of has a basketball pedigree who had a sustained level of success when like Gene Cady was there. It's like, they're not necessarily relevant. Like once this team goes away, they're gonna go back to somewhere in the middle in the cesspool that everybody else kind of lives in. And Indiana has been there for a while, but like whenever they get a new coach, it's like, oh, the Indiana job. And I'm like, I don't actually think it matters anymore. I think that they're kind of just another level, another program. And I hate to say that, and I don't mean to be disparaging, but they're the child actor that still thinks that they're doing something. And I don't think that they can. And I think that the Corey Feldman. Is, yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Indiana's I just, Corey Feldman. but like, you know how we said ge geography doesn't matter. Winning matters. Yes. And if you're a program like Indiana, you can't go around and say, well, we won national championships in the 80s with Bob Knight. Well, Bob Knight's dead now. Yeah, most of and these guys weren't alive then, man. No. The kids you're recruiting. You got to recruit on the what have you done for me lately. And that's where I think Mark Pope is in a good position because he played on a national championship team. And, hey, this program has won national championships recently. Indiana has.